Hello, it's Eric Strong from Strong Medicine and Stanford University. Today, I'll conclude this five video series on anemia with a discussion of how to take everything that we've already learned and incorporate it into an overall approach to diagnosis. By the end of this video, you'll be able to diagnose the specific etiology of an anemia in a patient on the basis of history and lab findings. Putting together an overall approach to anemia is a little hard to do because there are so many causes to consider and many causes don't fall neatly into a single category. For example, as I mentioned earlier, the cutoffs for things like MCV and retic index are not as precise as textbooks make it seem. Also, many cases of anemia are multifactorial and thus don't conform to a classically described pattern. But let's do our best. The first question to consider is whether the patient is actively bleeding. This is usually obvious, but not always, particularly in the case of a retroperitoneal bleed. But if active hemorrhage is identified, treat it, obviously, and reassess, keeping in mind that it may take many weeks for the hematological system to fully recover from a major bleed. If there's no hemorrhage, consider the history in some initial labs, specifically the retic count, the so-called hemolysis labs, including LDH, indirect bilirubin, and haptoglobin, and the blood smear. These labs will help to guide you towards underproduction versus hemolysis. Because underproduction is much more common than hemolysis, it's pretty typical for clinicians to go ahead and order an iron panel when ordering these others to save time, which is perfectly reasonable to do. Underproduction of red blood cells will be favored by a historical reason for it, including known malnutrition or the established presence of chronic inflammation, a lower tick count and or tick index, keeping in mind what was said in an earlier video about the significant uncertainty regarding what the cutoff should be for an inappropriately low tick count or index, a normal LDH, indirect bilirubin and haptoglobin, and a blood smear showing either hypersegmented neutrophils or hypochromia. Essentially, no patients with underproduction will have all of those findings, but it's a collection of multiple findings from that list which is consistent with this category. Hemolysis will be favored by a historical reason for it, including a past medical history of autoimmune or lymphoproliferative disorder, symptoms of disseminated intravascular coagulation, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, or hemolytic uremic syndrome, a personal or family history of an inherited RBC defect, a relatively high retic count or index, the combination of high LDH, high indirect bile, and low haptoglobin, and or a blood smear showing microspherocytes or schistocytes. And if the patient has history and findings that span both sides of this dichotomy, consider whether they could have both general processes occurring simultaneously. Now let's take a look at underproduction and hemolysis separately. Once probable underproduction has been identified, the next step is to look at the iron panel, vitamin B12 and folate levels, and a creatinine. If the MCV is low or low normal, and the iron panel shows the combination of low iron, high or normal transferrin and TIBC, low transferrin SAT and low ferritin, the patient has iron deficiency anemia. The next diagnostic step would be to figure out why. So assess the diet, menstrual history, and symptoms of malabsorption if you have not already done so. In any patient who is not a menstruating woman, a colonoscopy plus or minus an EGD is usually indicated to rule out occult GI malignancy or other process that could lead to a chronic subclinical GI blood loss. If the MCV is low or normal, and an iron panel shows low iron, low transferrin and TIBC, normal or low transferrin SAT, and a high ferritin, that's consistent with anemia of chronic inflammation. The patient should be evaluated to some extent for occult malignancy, autoimmune disease, and or chronic infection. And by evaluated, I don't necessarily mean a full body CT scan, PET scan, bone scan, and serum studies for a dozen different autoantibodies. The approach to looking for an occult chronic disease needs to be tailored to the specific patient, and in some cases, might just mean a thorough physical exam and increased frequency of clinic follow-ups. Heart failure and diabetes are also associated with this form of anemia. If the patient instead has a high creatinine, 
they may have anemia of chronic kidney disease, in which case that warrants a whole separate workup that's beyond the scope of this particular video series. For this video, I tried to track down data that which would tell us at what level of renal impairment anemia might start to develop. I could not find an overwhelmingly convincing paper that cited a specific GFR, but the general consensus appears that the risk starts at a relatively modest severity and increases as GFR drops. Next are a few less common etiologies of underproduction. If B12 and or folate are low, then you probably have at least part of the diagnosis, but now need to figure out why they are low. This includes assessing their diet, and specifically in the case of B12 deficiency, consider checking for autoantibodies against intrinsic factor and or the parietal cells of the stomach. If either B12 or folate are in the low normal range, one can consider checking levels of methylmalonic acid and homocysteine to identify functional B12 and folate deficiency respectively. A functional deficiency of these vitamins is when the patient technically has a normal value for the vitamin, but is manifesting symptoms or signs of deficiency, which improve after vitamin supplementation. If the patient has pancytopenia and or blast cells seen on smear, they probably have a primary bone marrow disorder warranting a bone marrow biopsy. Also consider flow cytometry to evaluate PNH, as this can present with pancytopenia, though it more classically also presents with signs of hemolysis. And if the patient's iron panel, creatinine, B12 folate, white blood cell count, and platelets are all normal, the next step is to check a TSH, LFTs, and plus or minus a testosterone to look for hypothyroidism, liver disease, and hypogonadism respectively. If one of these makes the diagnosis, great, work that up further. If not, a bone marrow biopsy can be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. If you suspect your patient has hemolysis, the main additional test to perform is the direct Coombs. If the direct Coombs is positive, plus or minus a smear that shows microspherocytes, the patient likely has autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and you should next work them up for possible lymphoproliferative and autoimmune disorders, keeping in mind that many cases of autoimmune hemolytic anemia are idiopathic, or primary, that is not associated with another disorder. If the Coombs is negative, the patient has severe thrombocytopenia, and you see schistocytes on smear, they have microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. If the patient is also septic, it's probably DIC. If they have prominent GI and or neuro symptoms, it's probably TTP or HUS. And if the patient is pregnant, think about HELP and DIC. If Coombs is negative and the MCV is low, a patient with hemolysis likely has thalassemia, which can be confirmed and subtyped via various methods of hemoglobin analysis. The remaining causes of hemolysis, all of which are associated with a negative Coombs, are usually suggested by the findings on a blood smear. If you see sickle cells, the patient has sickle cell disease. The presence of bite cells or Heinz bodies, which are red cell inclusions consisting of denatured hemoglobin, suggests G6PD deficiency or thalassemia. Spherocytes, when accompanied by negative Coombs, is consistent with hereditary spherocytosis. Basophilic stippling is seen in thalassemia, alcohol abuse, and heavy metal poisoning. And malaria and babesiosis can usually be identified by seeing the intracellular RBC parasites. If none of the above findings are present, but the patient is definitely hemolyzing, Consider Coombs negative autoimmune hemolytic anemia, thalassemia, and rare etiologies like Wilson's disease and paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. There is a common pitfall when it comes to diagnosing anemia in acutely ill patients, for example, those who have just been hospitalized. Patients who are experiencing acute volume depletion not related to hemorrhage, such as vomiting, diarrhea, excessive diuretics, or poor oral intake, may be hemoconcentrated, masking a chronic anemia. After the presentation to a hospital and the administration of a significant volume of IV fluids, the patient's hemoglobin can drop, leading to the suspicion of an acute bleed or acute hemolysis. However, this newer, lower hemoglobin is more likely to be the patient's baseline. I'm going to wrap up the discussion by listing the overall most common causes of anemia in U.S. adults. This assertion will be based primarily on my own experience rather than data because I honestly couldn't find good data about it. But in my experience, the overwhelming majority of cases 
are due to either iron deficiency, chronic inflammation, including malignancy, chronic kidney disease, a multifactorial picture, including hospital-acquired anemia, or frankly unknown, despite a reasonably thorough workup. Thanks for watching this series on anemia. If you found these videos to be helpful, remember to like and share them with your colleagues and classmates. Although this video is not sponsored, I nevertheless want to point out a great resource that some colleagues of mine have helped to create for learning more hematology and oncology as well, a website called hemocreview.com, that's heme with just one E. The site's primary purpose is to prepare docs for the U.S. Hemoc board exam. So it's not intended for students, but for people much further along in training, such as Hemoc fellows, or potentially highly motivated medicine residents considering a career in Hemoc. It is a subscription-based site, so not free, but it has over 1,300 questions of a variety of complexity, all of which contains detailed answers with links to NCCN guidelines and the primary literature. So if you see yourself taking the Hemoc boards in the next couple of years, consider checking it out.